The songs were, have been very powerful. I want to thank the worship team for their selection and the preparation that they did to, to uh, make this worship experience possible for us. And so now, after four months, about four months, we're coming to a conclusion to our study of Paul's letter to the Philippians. And we're going to wrap things up. We're going to look at a few verses, repeat a few verses, or part of a section that we considered last week, and then also at the, the, the last verses of the chapter that we read earlier during the scripture reading. So last week, we examined Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 through 19, from the perspective, perspective of it being a note of thanks for the gift that the church in Philippi sent to Paul while he was in prison in Rome. That was an important teaching. We, we were looking at this from the perspective of their giving and the nature of our giving to the Lord and how he desires that we would give to him joyously of the resources which he has entrusted to us. We're going to continue the study today of that particular passage of those verses because these passages, these verses contain some very important statements, three in particular that we're going to look at, that need to be seriously discussed and considered, and they are of vital importance for our Christian life. There are three specific phrases found in verses 10 through 19, which are among some of the most well-known passages or verses, statements in the Bible, and in fact, most Christians, and even people that are not necessarily familiar with the Bible, can often quote these, these passages, even though they may not be aware of where they come from. Certainly, any passage of ten verses, any section of just ten verses, that has three such well-known and important quotes in it, must be given special attention, and that's what we're going to do today. So let's start by looking at these three quotes and find out what the deeper truth is that we can extract from them. So first of all, this is one that many of you have probably seen before in which he says uh, in, um, in verse 11, he says, not, not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. Now this is important because it sheds light, first of all, on some false teaching which has become very prevalent in the body of Christ today. There is a very common and widely accepted teaching in modern American evangelical Christianity, and really worldwide, anyone that's been overseas and seen the church there will see that this idea of health, wealth, and prosperity has, has taken hold not just here in America, but, but throughout the world. And this teaching says that believers in Jesus Christ should only experience prosperity and success in whatever endeavor they undertake. There should be no trials, we should always be in good health, and live an essentially problem-free existence. Now this teaching is based primarily on the misapplication of Old Testament teaching about the relationship between material prosperity for the nation of Israel and their obedience to the law of Moses. There was this conditional teaching in the Old Testament, if you obey my laws, if you do what I say, then in return you will have wealth and prosperity and peace in the land. This was a promise that, that's given in the Old Testament to Israel. Also, it represents a misapplication. It's kind of a mixing of two uh, wrong sets of promises that are primarily for Israel. For, first of all, a misapplication of, the, of this conditional nature between obedience to the law and the prosperity in the land. Secondly, a misapplication of promises of health, peace, and prosperity that will be realized in the future, future millennial kingdom on earth, and then taking those promises and trying to make them fit into the body of Christ. It's usually stated that those who don't experience health, wealth, and prosperity, which these pe preachers speak about, the problem is that they have some kind of unconfessed sin in their life or they lack the faith to claim those promises that God has made. That's usually the form that this kind of teaching takes. Now when we compare that teaching with the situation of the Apostle Paul and what he faced, we see a stark contradiction. First, I don't believe that any preacher today with any amount of sincerity would begin to question the commitment or the faith of the Apostle Paul. 
No one had been more sold out for the cause of Christ than Paul. Likewise, no one had a greater spiritual impact in this world other than Jesus Christ himself. The work that Paul did during his life has endured for nearly 2,000 years, and the message that he preached about the Lord Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection, has changed the course of history. Therefore, by the reasoning of the health, wealth, and prosperity teachers, Paul should have never experienced the trials and tribulations which characterized his entire ministry. Yet he experienced all kinds of hardships, things that none of us could even imagine. Clearly, the prosperity teachers are in error when we look at the example of the Apostle Paul. There is no promise of a life of abundant wealth, free from difficulties and trials in this life for us as members of the body of Christ. And Paul knew that well when he said that he knew how to have, how to have plenty and how to be in need, how to feel full and how to be hungry. When he spoke of bearing about in his body, in Galatians 16, bearing about in his body the marks of Christ, he was stating that he understood suffering in a very real way. What's more, he proudly and willingly renounced all the opportunities that were available to him because of his education and his background as a Jewish student of the great Rabbi Gamaliel. He gave all of that up. He considered that all worthless so that he could pursue the righteousness and a life that, was, that, that, that uh, glorified the Lord Jesus Christ. He was willing to give up the opportunities for prosperity and for wealth and for, for a good, easy life. He gave it all up in order to follow Christ. So it is certain that when Paul said that he had learned to be content in every situation, he was talking about difficult, unpleasant conditions that involved discomfort, uncertainty, and suffering. In fact, these very words were written just for such a situation. He was locked away, and they were written in such, such a situation. He was locked away in a rented house with a guard watching every move that he made. He did not have the freedom to come and go. He was, he was imprisoned. He, he, he lacked just the, the common uh, freedoms and the common joys that, that normal people had, and yet he could write these things and say that he was content in whatever situation he found himself. Now, another important thing, he says that he was content in every situation, but not necessarily with every situation. It's important to note a significant detail re regarding Paul's wording here. He said that he was content in whatever situation he found himself, but as I said, not with every situation. In other words, he was not saying that being locked away in a single room was a good thing. He recognized that it was not ideal and it was not the place that he wanted to be. We might also say that Paul learned to be content in every situation, but he was not satisfied with every situation. There's a difference in, in the idea there. Paul fully intended, as we were studying through this, this letter to the Philippians, and, and he talked about his future plans, what he anticipated doing, he fully intended and desired to be released from prison and return to visit the Philippians. He talks about coming and, and, and planning to go there. He made every effort to accomplish that goal. In fact, he, he had appealed to Caesar. He could have been imprisoned, perhaps even executed, while he was still in, in Judea, uh, in Caesarea, but he appealed to the emperor, to Caesar, so that his, his sentence could be overturned, and then he could return to traveling and preaching freely throughout the Roman Empire. However, in the meantime, he found himself locked away under house arrest. Since given that he could do nothing at that moment about his circumstances, he determined that it would be far better for him to find contentment in the Lord than to simply be despondent and angry about his situation. Paul likewise gives instructions to the, to the believers to accept situations that we find ourselves in with a sense of contentment in the Lord. But if we can change those conditions, we should do so. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul is writing to enslaved members of the Corinthian church. Now, the issue of slavery is one of the most complex and perplexing ones in the Bible. Based on God's deliverance of Israel from slavery in Egypt and the general sense that the scriptures teach, we can conclude that the institution of slavery was something that was abhorrent to God. 
Yet we also know that slavery, like many other things in this world, like war, like uh, corrupt governments, like uh, so many things that, that we have to face uh, in this world, was outside of God's perfect will. Nonetheless, it was a social reality at the time that, that uh, the Old Testament was written, at the time that Paul was writing. And in our fallen world, it had to be encountered and addressed by the people of God. So in 1 Corinthians 7.21, the Apostle Paul... Sorry, I don't have that passage uh, written down here. 1 Corinthians 7.21, Paul instructs the believing slaves in Corinth to remain in the situation in which they had found themselves. It says, were you called while a slave? Do not be concerned about it. But then he goes out and adds this, but if you can be made free rather use it. So he's saying that this is a situation that you found yourself in and, 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 this is, and you may have to remain there. However, if you have an opportunity to change that and legitimately be freed from that situation, you should take advantage of it. So we see Paul gives instructions to the believers. You're not in, in a situation you may not, you may not, uh, you're in a situation you may not want to be in and it's not ideal. Find contentment in the Lord but if you can change that, you should take the initiative to do so. 1 Corinthians 7.21 The lesson from this is that it is appropriate for us to seek solutions to difficult and unpleasant situations that we find ourselves in. God does not demand masochism to suffer simply for the sake of suffering. Rather, however, when we find ourselves helpless, without options, we must rely on the assurance that, God, that the Lord does know what is best for us and to trust him. If we can improve our situation, we should do so. And God gives us that, that opportunity there. It's very similar to the prayer that, um, that said it's used by a lot of... Uh, um, like Alcoholics Anonymous and, and, and groups where, where people are dealing with, with great anxiety and stress in their life, that, that serenity prayer. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. And so God gives us that opportunity to change our situation. We don't have to remain in, a, in an unpleasant, uh, uh, distressful condition. However, however, when we can't change it, he expects us to look to him, to trust him, and to find contentment in what he has done for us and in his goodness and his grace expressed to us. And then Paul goes on to say that he has learned the secret both to have plenty and to have little. So let's just look at that passage here in Philippians 4. Um, in which he says, uh, verse 12, I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. So first of all, he says that he learned how to have contentment, both with plenty and, when in, and in need. The insight that he gained into how he was to live in relation to his circumstances apparently did not come to him naturally. He had to learn how to accept the situation that he was in. Being content is really not part of our flesh. The flesh is always inclined towards discontent. The flesh is never going to let us be happy, but will always seek to draw us closer and closer to the world, which will eventually devour us and shut us out of our experience of God's grace. The other interesting thing which Paul notes here is that he not only has learned to be content when he was in need and lacking material things, but he makes it a point to say that he has learned to be content when he has plenty. Now, most of us would be a little surprised with that comment. Well, what do you mean? I, I, I could be plenty content if I had plenty, if I had everything that I need, if all, all of my needs were met and, and I had abund an abundance of money and things and, and all those things. That would certainly seem, we would think, that would come naturally to us. However, all we need to do is to look around at the tragic lives of so many of the rich and famous to find out that there are many that really don't know how to find contentment in abundance. One who has more than is necessary for, their needs, for the needs of life has to learn about contentment as much as someone that is lacking. In fact, in many cases, those people are the least content. 
Just because you have all of your physical needs met and you have abundance of these things in this world does not mean that that is a recipe for contentment. In fact, it can even mean greater discontent because it gives, it gives us the resources and the opportunity to look for happiness in all the wrong places. If you have the money to, to do what you shouldn't be doing, you're going to be doing that and you're, going to, you're not going to find contentment there. And so what we see is that learning to be content, yes, we have to learn to be content when we have less than we need in those difficult situations, but even in times of abundance, that requires learning to trust the Lord and learning to look to Him. Understanding contentment is a learned behavior that has to be taught to people living no matter what their situation is. It's a learned behavior taught to us by the Holy Spirit. Now, what we, Paul says he learned the secret of contentment. Now, really, there's no secret at all because all of it is, he, he reveals it all in the scriptures. That in whatever circumstances he found himself, he was able to be content. He describes everything in his writings about what it took for him to understand to be, how to be content in every situation. So what were the reasons or the secret of Paul's contentment? First of all, he had a renewed mind. We discussed this a couple of weeks ago in detail when we looked at verse 8, which says, Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. We talked during that time, we talked about the renewed mind. And we looked at the characteristics of a mind that was not conformed to the pattern of this world. We identified that the renewed mind had the following characteristics. First of all, it had a Christian, this is a review from two weeks ago. It had, the renewed mind has a Christian worldview. It looks at the world around us in light of revealed scripture. A Christian worldview, it is illuminated by the Holy Spirit. Not only is the truth there of the word con, that, that before us, but we accept it, we embrace it because of the illumination of the Holy Spirit. And like, likewise, the renewed mind replaces one pattern of thinking with another. We mentioned that there were five patterns of thinking which rob us of peace and cause us to be anxious. Paul, prior to that, in the passage we looked at, said, Do not be anxious for anything, but by prayer and supplication let your requests be made known to God. We identified those, those uh, areas, those patterns of thinking to be worry, discontent, comparison to others, damage, and guilt, and that each of those uh, are thieves of peace which we are promised to in the scriptures. So he, um, so he, was, he had a renewed mind. Uh, then the renewed mind also, it says, replaces one pattern of thinking for another, and it focuses on good things, which we had read. The second key to Paul's contentment, first of all, was a renewed mind. Secondly, he made Christ supreme in his life. Until we give the Lord Jesus Christ his rightful place in our hearts, we will not have that sense of contentment. That's not to say we won't be saved if you haven't elevated Christ to the position of, of Lord of all of your life. We are saved because we believe that Jesus Christ died for our sins. That's the gospel message. He died, was buried, and rose again. That simple message, when we, when we let go of trying to do it ourselves and give it all to him through the belief in that message, we have the gift of eternal life. However, to find this contentment one of the requirements, I believe, is that we need to make Christ supreme. Not for salvation, but for experiencing the total joy that's ent entitled to us as the children of God. The other things which we value will always be in competition with the Lord's priority, and it will rob us of the contentment that we seek. Likewise, it's not just the influence of the world that keeps us from experiencing that peace, but if, we're, if we have not given, uh, given Christ his rightful place in our life, the Holy Spirit is not going to give us peace either. He will be constantly, he will be that hound of God on our conscience that will remind us that even though we are saved, our priorities are screwed up. And so the Spirit of God also can keep us from having that peace if we have not given the, the, the appropriate priority to our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. Likewise, the Apostle Paul believed the truth of Romans 8.28. 
that all things work together for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Now this well-known verse really serves as a litmus test of our faith in the goodness of God and his care for us. Just like Job, we were, uh, we were not with God when he hung the stars in the sky or made the creatures of the sea and the land. Yet we are given a promise from God that regardless of the circumstances we find ourselves in, God is greater than our pain, greater than our suffering, greater than our insecurity, greater than all the experiences of this world. There is a bigger plan of which we are not privy to. We don't know what, what is, how God is working in this world. And such a perspective will make it possible for us to accept each and every situation and respond with contentment. To know that all things work together for him. And then finally, the Apostle Paul had an eternal perspective. So what were the reasons for his contentment? He had a renewed mind. He made Christ supreme in his life. He believed the truth of Romans 8.28, and he had an etern eternal perspective. Paul lived his mortal life with the certainty of the life to come. We are often so trapped in our own minds in the life in this body. This is all we can think of, and we never, we never put ourselves outside of these circumstances. It becomes nearly impossible for us to meditate on the glory of our redemption after we pass from this life and when we will be present with the Lord. Paul, however, understood that, not just intellectually, but within the depths of his soul, that there was so much more to look forward to than just this world and this life. He said earlier in this very letter that he was torn between remaining in this physical life so that he could minister to the Philippians or being in the presence of the Lord. He says, I'm torn between the two. I'm, I'm, I'm struggling between the two. I need to be here because God has called me to, to minister to you. I have work that I have to do with you. But if it were my choice, I would rather be with him. And so here we see that eternal perspective that he had. He wasn't just looking at the things of this world. Having developed a strong awareness of these realities, of the reality of the eternal in his mind, Paul was able to understand the fleeting nature of every circumstance we find ourselves in, whether in abundance or in need. He could then have a sense of contentment and peace, not because of his immediate circumstances, but because of the, un, the unchanging reality of God's love and grace and his eternal plan. And then the second, so the first important statement that we read was Paul had learned to be content in whatever situation he found himself in. The second important statement in this passage that we read today is where he says in verse 13, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And this passage is it's one in which believers have relied upon for encouragement and inspiration for 2,000 years since it was written. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Of course, this is not a promise to be able to perform miracles or do supernatural acts. It doesn't mean that you can leap a tall building in a single bound. That's not what he's saying here. Perhaps a better way of stating this is to say, all things which I must do, I can do through Christ who gives me strength. This, uh, in fact, uh, Wiest, uh, a commentator, says it this way, I am strong for all things in the one who constantly infuses strength in me. This is a statement of continued reliance on the Lord, which is a far greater force than, than anything that the world is going to, to, to send our way. The, the difficult circumstances that Paul was facing, which included imprisonment and possibly being executed, he knew that he could endure those because of the strength that Christ was giving to him. Making the right choices is not an easy thing to do. So as we live our life, every day we're faced with moral and ethical decisions. Uh, we were faced deciding what we want to do or where we need to go or how we need to act how we need to respond. And many times we need that strength to make the proper choice. Choosing the will of God oftentimes means going against what will be most convenient, what is most economically advantageous, or what is most popular in society. It will require courage and a reliance on the power of Christ to empower us, to embolden us to make the right choices. 
If we say no to temptation to be involved in any activity, whatever it is that violates the will of God, it often requires the strength that, that the apostle is talking about here. When God calls us to endure extreme hardship, whether persecution or physical distress, this is when we rely upon this supernatural strength that allows us to do the right thing at the right time. This was the strength of the early Christian martyrs who refused to recant their faith despite the fact that they were facing certain death. And yet they were able to say, I will not recant, I will not give up, I will not renounce my Savior Jesus Christ. They were given that strength at just the right time. That's what they were called to do in those circumstances, and those that, 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 uh, that held to their, their faith, they were given that strength, they relied upon it, and they, in many cases, experienced persecution. To witness for Christ in a hostile environment, or just when people are going to mock us, make fun of us, it needs, we need that strength to rely upon, uh, to, to, to trust the Lord, that he's going to give us the strength to do the right thing. This is the strength needed to push on, even with the, the normal affairs, the drudgery of life. When we want to do something more exciting and more fulfilling and just say, I'm done with this. I, I want something new. I want something different. We need that strength of getting up every day, doing what we need to do. This too, just, just carrying on a normal life, requires the supernatural strength a lot of times that we get from, from the Lord. But God gives us the strength to do what we need to do when we need to do it. Paul gives the promise in 1 Corinthians 10, a passage that many of us are familiar with, that no temptation has overtaken us except as is common to man, but God is faithful, who will not allow us to be tempted beyond what we are able, but with that temptation will make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Furthermore, in 2 Corinthians 12, 10, we learn that in our very moments of weakness, it's the power of God that overwhelms us and gives us the strength that we never knew we had. Just like, you know, you've heard the stories of how um, when a, a child is maybe run over by a car or some heavy object is on their child, mothers have been able to, to pick, pick up actual cars because they have this adrenaline rush that just overwhelms their body. And this, is, this, I think, is what happens when we look to the Lord. He gives us this adrenaline rush of his spirit. He says here in this passage, which we are most, familiar, most of us are familiar with, and he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. God's strength is there for us throughout life. All we need to do is to call upon it. There's a famous saying by the missionary Hudson Taylor, which says, The will of God will never take you where the grace of God cannot keep you. And then the third of these important statements and promises that we see here in this passage of scripture is one in verse 19 which says and my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory this promise is of course given in the context of his needs having been supplied through the gift of the Philippian church it's right in the context of his thanks for giving that timely gift he needed the, that money at that time, the Philippians were moved by the Holy Spirit, led by the Holy Spirit. They sent that money with Epaphroditus and it arrived at just the right time. And then in the midst of that experience, Paul writes these words, my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory. And while it is true there are no guarantees of abundant material prosperity, we do have the promise of God that our immediate needs will be met. Now part of the problem that we face, and particularly as Americans, because we are used to so much abundance, uh, what we think is a need is not really a need. What did Paul and what did God recognize as our needs? He says, and having food and clothing with these, we shall be content. Now, most of us would not really agree with that. We believe that we have to have much more than that. We've got to have, you know, 5G 
uh, Wi-Fi or we have to be able to, you know, you, you name it. And that's what we really need to be content. But this isn't what Paul says. If we have food and clothing, these are truly the only thing that we need in this world. Uh, and, and so we, would we ever really be content? Could we really be content if this was all we had? If you feel deprived and neglected by God, just think of all that he has promised, which is just this, all of the material possessions, food, clothing, and shelter, and then figure that everything that we have over and above that is gravy. That's all blessing. That's all in addition. All that we really need has been given to us, and yet he has given us more, more, and more than we would ever, than we ever really need, ever, more than is absolutely necessary. And at times, we will see that even life itself, this physical life, is not what we need. Paul said earlier in the letter that he longed with all his heart that he could be with the Lord. But he, and he specifically said, however, that at this moment, he needed to be present with the Philippians. In this passage here, Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you, and being confident of this, I know that I shall remain and continue with you, for your progress and joy of faith. But then he goes on to say in that passage, but I would rather, I would rather be with the Lord. But at that time, life was what God demanded of him, this physical life. But it's also possible, nobody has a guarantee of, of any day beyond today. If God chooses to take us, that's perhaps what he, we need. In other words, as God saw it, Paul had a need to be alive at this time, even though Paul himself would have preferred to be with the Lord. When we are no longer, when that need no longer exists, God will call us home. In the meantime, we realize that God has a purpose for us in this life. And that's important. This passage teaches us. As long as we are here, God has a purpose for us. He's leaving us here for a reason. He'll call us home when he's ready to do so. But in the meantime, recognize that he is leaving us here for a purpose. And we need to find out what that purpose is and to be willing to allow him to work through us. Knowing that we are here being used by him will help us appreciate our purpose in life and add to that sense of contentment. When we know that we are here to be used by God and we are allowing ourselves to, to do what he wants us to do, that will help to add to that sense of contentment that we need. Now, those three important passages, of course, are, are, are vital for us. Three very important truths. I just want to finish up real quickly uh, with some of the closing comments that he said. Very briefly, I want to comment on the conclusion of the letter. This is the end of our study of the letter to the Philippians. Paul ends by passing on his greetings to the, to the believers in Philippi, as well as greetings from those who were with him, which is typical of all of his letters. Greet every saint in Christ. The brethren who are with me greet you. So they're, they're sending these, these warm greetings to one another. He also passes on greetings to all the saints, and he, he includes one special group of believers that are also greeting these believers in Philippi, and that was, it says, those who are of the household of Caesar. This tells us that while he was in Rome, the gospel had reached all the way into the palace of the emperor of Rome. This same idea is related in the first chapter in which Paul stated that because of his imprisonment, members of the company of guards who protected the emperor, the praetorium, the very men who had immediate contact with the emperor himself, had heard and embraced the good, good news that Jesus Christ is the, is the Lord. Now at the same time that Paul wrote this, he wrote this while Nero was the emperor of Rome, who was a cruel and unpredictable despot. Nero, Nero was a man who eventually had Paul executed, and the Roman Empire brutally persecuted Christians soon after Paul's death. However, during the lifetime of the Apostle Paul, God's grace, the message of God's grace and love and forgiveness, had reached into the household of the most powerful person in the world at that time. Now, the term Caesar's household probably does not refer to the emperor, emperor himself. It may not even refer to his immediate relatives, but it means it was referring to the court that surrounded him. It might have been the servants, the soldiers, other government officials. However, because Paul was willing to suffer and to be imprisoned for Christ, the good news reached to the highest level of the Roman power structure. 
because Paul was willing to be content in the situation that he found himself. Rather than moping and sulking and feeling sorry for himself, he made his imprisonment an opportunity to speak up for the Lord who had given everything for him. He took advantage of this situation. Rather than, he could have easily sat around and said, oh, poor me, here I am in prison. What have I done wrong? I, you know, life is so, so bad for me and woe is me. He didn't. He took an opportunity. He found contentment in the Lord. At the moment, he could not change his circumstances. But by relying upon uh, on the strength of God, he used that as an opportunity to share the good news with those that were guarding him. They, in turn, took it and brought it into the household of Caesar, into the the very uh, halls of power of the most, most important empire of the world at that time. So today we've looked in detail at three statements by the Apostle Paul that reassure us that God is a very real and near presence in our lives. He said, I have learned to be content in every situation. I can do all things who, through Christ who gives me strength, and my God shall supply all our needs according to his riches and glory. Now, such words should move us to be drawn closer to him. Relying each day on his grace and trusting his wisdom and his guidance, we can make it through this life with a sense of purpose and victory. Life does have meaning when we live it with a sense that we are living for something greater than ourselves. And knowing that we are not living it alone, but we're living it with the power of, of the living God within us. Christ is a very real and intimate companion in our life. He's not some distant deity that's up there someplace that has no concern over what we're doing, or he's just zapping us because he's unhappy with us. The Lord Jesus Christ, our God, is real, and through his Spirit, he lives in our lives. He's not just a nice thought either that inspires us to be a little bit better. He is, in fact, the living Savior living in our hearts. Through God's Spirit, we have a real and a living person that motivates us to live above this world and its struggles and its challenges. And I hope that we can look at these words today and we can trust them and believe the truth that Jesus Christ is, in fact, alive and living in our lives today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this word. We thank you for these passages. We thank you for the truth which they contain. And we ask, Lord, that you would give us the strength to make these a reality in our life. Lord, as we go out this week, let us be a reminder to the world as the world looks to, the, to this celebration of the Lord's 